With Intel's Coffee Lake CPUs slowly becoming more available as the months go on, for those of you who haven't upgraded in a while, it might be something you'd want to consider since this is Intel's most significant leap forward since a few generations ago. And I know, Ryzen is always a great buy and is something that I always recommend to you guys, but if you want better memory support and single-threaded performance, Intel's 8th generation processors are a great option. And for those of you who haven't checked out my 8600K review, you can check that out in the top right hand corner. Otherwise, stick around because today we're going to be taking a look at a Z370 motherboard that packs some pretty good value, but does have one issue. This is Gigabyte Z370 Aorus Gaming Ultra motherboard and coming in at 139 US dollars, which is definitely on the low end for the Z370 chipset. You are getting some good value here and a great board on the surface for something like an 8600K, but let's take a closer look. On the surface, we're getting a fairly neutral color scheme, which I can always appreciate with a subtle orange stripe on the IO shroud and the rest of the board looking black and gray with a silhouette of the Aorus logo in a lighter shade on the bottom half, which I think is a nice touch. The MOSFET heatsink seems sufficient enough for cooling, but we'll talk a little bit more about the testing on those later. And the PCH heatsink has some tasteful design to it, mostly made up of triangles that reflect the RGB very nicely and also features the Aorus logo. Other than that, this board takes RGB to the absolute next level with LEDs surrounding the VRMs, the PCI Express slots, and also the RAM dims. And we'll take a look at illumination in just a bit, but first let's look at the specs and feature list. Now, it feels like I say this in almost every motherboard review, but support for Nvidia's SLI and AMD's Crossfire are there, although multi-GPU configurations are slowly fading away and are not something that I'd particularly recommend unless you've got money to burn, which in case you probably wouldn't be buying this board. Anyway, the top two slots support SLI and all three for Crossfire, and we are getting support for two M.2 slots as well, up to 2280 on the bottom and 22110 on the top. For SATA based storage, we're getting four SATA ports on a right angle to the right of the board and two more located right at the bottom. For memory, we're getting support for up to 64 gigabytes across the four RAM DIMMs with speeds of up to 4000 megahertz via XMP. In terms of USB ports, we're getting two 2.0 ports, four 3.1 Gen 1 ports, and two 3.1 Gen 2 ports, with one of those being USB-C. And oddly enough, we're getting Dual Link DVI as well, which sort of does hint which end of the market this is targeted towards. All right, so motherboard is seated and we are almost ready for testing. I've got to assemble the rest of the system as you guys can see. But on this chip, the i5-8600K, I was able to hit 5.4 gigahertz on the MSI uh, Z370 Gaming M5 board. So if you haven't seen that, go and check that out. I'll chuck a link up in the top right hand corner. But yeah, very interested to see what we can hit on this board, seeing as it is significantly cheaper than that one. And we will be testing the MOSFET heat sinks as well, of course, because this board has been known to get quite hot uh, in rendering situations and whatnot. So it'll be interesting to see with the 8600K pushed over five gigahertz, if we can even get there in the first place, how hot those heat sinks are actually really gonna get. So out of the box, you'll be greeted with a lot of orange LEDs all over, but those are easily configurable to pretty much whatever color you'd like. And the great thing is that each region on this board can easily be assigned to a different color. So you're not just stuck with one color all over. The board definitely lights up, that's for sure, but this is bordering on too much in my opinion. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Now, overclocking. It's evident that a lot of the focus on this board is how it looks, but it can be pushed to a reasonable level, although I wouldn't really recommend it as you soon will see. I was able to push the 8600K all the way up to 5.1 gigahertz at 1.35 volts, but at that point, the VRMs were getting seriously, seriously hot. I mean, check this out. Here, the system's running Prime 95 with that overclock in place, and the VRMs are getting pretty damn hot, upwards of 125C with no signs of stopping. At this point, the VRMs were rising about one degree every five to 10 seconds, and I was pretty surprised to see no throttling at this point, but I decided to cut it there just to be on the safe side. Now, I know MOSFETs can take an absolute beating when it comes to temperature threshold, but 125 degrees C is really quite excessive, especially when there are heat sinks on the board with a good amount of surface area as well. It's definitely not what I was expecting. Now, do keep in mind that the V-Core for the 8600K was running at 1.35 volts, and we're also running Prime95, a very CPU intensive program. And so for a light overclock of say 4.8 gigahertz at 1.25 volts in your typical gaming load, you're not really gonna see those MOSFETs skyrocket so high. So we do need to keep a little bit of perspective. 
Actual CPU temps under load were a little bit warmer than I expected though, with the 8600K sitting at an average of 72 degrees C with that overclock in place. And keep in mind that this processor has been delittered and was sufficiently cooled by the Thermaltake 240mm Flow Ring Liquid AIO. And so here's the bottom line. If you do a lot of rendering or video encoding, for example, and you're planning on running an overclock of around five gigahertz, then I'd highly recommend at looking at some more premium options out there. Gigabyte have some more premium options such as the Aorus Gaming 5 and 7 and these are much more generous in terms of VRM phases and should do the job quite well. Of course, consider other vendors as well such as ASUS, MSI or EVGA. On the other hand, if the majority of what you're doing is gaming and you're not planning on going beyond 1.3 volts for the CPU voltage, then this board is still a great option for the mellow price of $139 US dollars. So as always guys, drop your comments down below. Would you pick this up if you were building a Z370 system or would you get something a little bit more premium? Don't forget to hit that like button to show your support and I will see you all in the next one.